It may be a stretch of the imagination, but I felt like an explorer discovering an unknown Amazonian tribe when I met the Nisei of Western Nebraska. In 2004, I was a history graduate student when I learned about descendants of early 20th century Japanese settlers living in the Panhandle. I decided I had to meet them. The drive west gave me time to think about our meeting. I'm a Korean adoptee. There are long-standing issues between the countries of Korea and Japan. Would they be willing to share their stories with me? But just like them, I'm a Nebraskan. Maybe our cultural backgrounds wouldn't be a problem. Roger and Nancy Sato, Mick Cara, and members of the Sakurada family invited me to a potluck supper. It was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. One of the first things they explained was the distinction of Issei, Nisei, Sansei, and Yonsei. Issei refers to the generation of Japanese who immigrated to America. Their American-born children are the Nisei. Their grandchildren are Sansei followed by Yonsei, the great-grandchildren. Most Issei men came to America young and single. For the Sakurada family, their dad, Tokuzo, came to the U.S. in the first decade of 1900 when he was 18. Traveling from California to the North Platte Valley, he traded railroad work for farming a relatively new crop sugar beets. Growing sugar beets was extremely labor intensive to plant, tend, and harvest. This proved advantageous for the Japanese immigrants due to their excellent abilities in farming and their short stature. But even though they were allowed to work the land, anti-immigrant legislation of the day prevented Japanese immigrants from owning land. Even Nebraska was not immune to such sentiment and passed its own Anti-Alien Land Act in 1921. The law would stand until the 1950s. Many women wanting to escape their impoverished life in Japan came to America as picture brides. They sent portraits to prospective husbands living in the States. Once a mutual decision was made, they traveled across the Pacific and were met by their future husbands at the various ports of entries. There, they not only exchanged marital vows, but also their traditional clothing for Western-style clothes. But life in the new country was far from the young wives' dreams of comfort and leisure. Some children remember their mother saying, if it wasn't for an ocean separation, they would have walked back home. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese families on the West Coast were put in internment camps. Japanese immigrants of the North Platte Valley were allowed to stay on their farms because they were critical to the war effort and lived in the middle of the country. But they were monitored, had their radios, cameras, and guns seized, were restricted to 50 miles of travel and forced to carry permits. And then there was the prejudice. 
to avoid looking sympathetic to their former homeland. Families burned or buried their Japanese heirlooms and letters from relatives living in Japan. Mick Hara's family may have been the rare exception. When the mayor of Henry, Nebraska came to her parents' home with law enforcement, Mick remembers him being sympathetic as they removed contraband items. Today, she has three items that belong to her parents. A statue, a wooden wall hanging, and a beautifully carved vase. Even while living under scrutiny, sons of Japanese immigrants enlisted in the United States military. The 442nd Regiment was comprised of Japanese Americans. When the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, some of the Nisei remember being indifferent. That attitude changed as they learned the bombs killed some of their family members. Ted Horace said that while serving in Korea during that war, he took leave to visit his father's relatives in Japan. Ted managed to locate his aunt and her two sons. All three carried terrible scars from the bomb, and his uncle was vaporized at Hiroshima. Yet, to Ted's amazement, even while dressed in his army uniform, his relative showed no animosity. Since my first visit, I've made several return trips to the Panhandle. This past fall, I attended the annual Friendly Circle Bazaar The bazaar is a treat for patrons. That looks like a different week. Yeah. Because they are able to purchase homemade Japanese food. Well, I was over there talking to him, and one guy go, just, he just went right there and he goes, okay, I gotta do my yearly order of the mushi. Or the rice so, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> such as bento dinners, mushi, <laughs> sushi rolls, as well as a variety of baked and canned goods. <laughs> there are also handmade crafts based on Japanese traditions. This is sticky no. Do you like that one? Yes. They began the fundraiser in the 1980s to pay for the upkeep of the Japanese hall. Built in 1928, it's one of the only remaining structures constructed by the Japanese community. <laughs> Many have fond memories of the hall, as it's where they attended summer school. It was a place to socialize while learning about their heritage. It was mainly time away from farm work and to have fun. As a historian, I like cemeteries. because so much information can be gleaned from the headstones. When I first met the Nisei, I was lulled into a false sense they would live forever. However, since I began interviewing them, 
Several have passed away, and I'm compelled to do something to honor them. Their story is an immigrant story. A Japanese-American story. And a rural story. But first and foremost, a Nebraska story. <laughs>